Good evening, everyone. If I could ask you to take your seats. I know many of you are coming in from committee meetings and sessions and dinners and things, so thank you for being here tonight. Um, before we get started and I introduce our award winner, I want to make a, just a couple of quick announcements. Um, first is immediately after this session is the meeting of the members, and in case you aren't aware, that is open to everyone, and we encourage you to stick around and hear about what the organization has been doing. Uh, the second thing I wanted to remind you of is that in your um, registration packet when you picked up your badge, there is a um, public policy survey that AAPT would love to get your feedback on. Um, if you haven't already completed it, we encourage you to complete it and bring it to the exhibit hall, um, to the AAPT booth, or there's a drop box um, at the AIP AAPT public policy booth. Um, and if you don't make it by 4 o'clock tomorrow, when the exhibit hall closes for the last time, you can also drop it off at the registration desks. So we would really appreciate your input on um, that and you know, while you're there, visit the exhibitors, show your love, get some love, all that kind of stuff. So um, with that, I'd like to introduce our award winner. Um, but first, a little background. The John David Jackson Award for Excellence in Graduate Physics Education is presented to physicists and physics educators who, like J.D. Jackson himself, after whom the award is named, have made outstanding contributions to curriculum development, mentorship, or classroom teaching in graduate physics education. Jackson's theoretical work in nuclear and particle physics is illustrious, but it is perhaps for his graduate textbook, Classical Electrodynamics, that he is most well known and, in some cases, feared myself included. <laughs> um, that doesn't seem to be the case with our winner tonight. Mehran Karrar, the Francis Friedman Professor of Physics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, received his BA in Natural Sciences and an MA from the University of Cambridge, and later completed his PhD at MIT. From 1983 to 86, he was a junior fellow of the Harvard Society of Fellows and a visiting summer research collaborator at Brookhaven National Laboratories. In 1986, he joined the MIT Department of Physics as an assistant professor, moving through the ranks and eventually moving into a full professorship in 1996. Mehan's influence in graduate statistical physics is substantial. Nomination letters written from students who took his classes more than 20 years ago sound like they were written about something that happened last year. To quote, even during his first year of teaching, Professor Carter's year-long course on modern statistical physics stood out as the best organized and the most lucid, and his homework assignment the most thought-provoking among the many excellent lectures we had. However, it was only after we started teaching physics ourselves that we were able to appreciate the scope of this achievement. The extensive notes Mehran routinely made available to his students eventually became two textbooks published by Cambridge Press in 2007 and adopted by several leading physics departments. In the nomination materials, Mehran was further praised for both his selfless and effective mentoring of students and his influential research in physics, as well as the strong interactions between the two areas of his professional life. One of his publications has more than 2,500 citations, and more than a dozen of his doctoral advisees have permanent faculty or research positions. For all these contributions to physics education, AAPT is proud to present the 2018 John David Jackson Award for Excellence in Graduate Physics Education to Dr. Mehran Kardar. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm uh, very honored by this award. Uh, when I think back uh, about my own graduate uh, education, the works of uh, David Jack Jackson and past uh, winners, such as uh, Pines, uh, Thorne, and Cummings, have been very influential. And so I'm very honored to be uh, uh, receiving the same award uh, that uh, they had also received. Uh, so thank you again. and. Uh, I'll try to now give you something that hopefully will be relevant uh, to teaching in statistical physics. Uh, can I go to the... Uh, okay. So, uh, 
I guess uh, physics deals with uh, force and motion, and statistical physics has to do, uh, deal with fluctuations. So as a statistical physicist, I can be very true to my profession by thinking about uh, force and interactions. And uh, uh, I'm going to start by uh, reminding you about equilibrium forces and fluctuations and gradually move over to non-equilibrium phenomena. So again, as a statistical physicist, I feel contractually bound to uh, start with the ideal gas law. And typically, we imagine or the ideal gas pressure as being a consequence of the impacts of the particles on the walls of the container. But uh, uh, thinking about it more deeply through statistical physics, we realize that it is, in fact, a consequence of fluctuations and the change in the availability of fluctuations as the volume of uh, some kind of a box is changed. And even some systems like uh, ions moving in a solution exert a similar pressure that satisfies this ideal gas law, which in the dilute limit is simply uh, the proportionality of the pressure uh, with density and what the effective temperature, the temperature of the system is. Of course, when we go to uh, uh, denser systems, the ideality of this result uh, will uh, uh, be uh, receiving corrections proportional to uh, 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 virial coefficients arising from uh, interactions. Now, in the title of my talk, I also had something about uh, quantum electrodynamics, and it's not going to be particularly profound. I'm just going to take the ideal gas law in the limit where the box is empty of any particles, but even empty uh, box contains electromagnetic fluctuations. If you like, you can think of uh, replacing particles with photons. The difference is that the density of photons varies with temperature. So temperature introduces a length scale, which is a result of the competition of the thermal uh, fluctuations, KT, and quantum mechanical effects, H bar and C being the speed of light. And uh, this length scale you can convert into some kind of a density, which is the inverse of that cubed. And if you think about this density in ideal gas law, you get uh, essentially the Stefan Boltzmann uh, type of uh, 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 pressure, which is proportional to the fourth power of temperature. So if you start with this uh, formula of Stefan Boltzmann and say, okay, what happens if I go all the way to zero temperature? You might think that the pressure and the forces that appear on the uh, uh, walls of the container go to zero. And of course, Casimir demonstrated that that's not the case. Once this length scale, uh, as you go to zero temperature, becomes larger and larger and becomes comparable to the size of the box, then additional quantum effects become important. And essentially, in the formula for pressure, you have to rep uh, replace temperature, which you can think of through this formula as being related to some kind of inverse length scale with the uh, size of the box itself with the separation of two plates D. And then you get the uh, Casimir formula for the uh, force or pressure that is inversely proportional to uh, the distance d to the fourth power. So you can sort of relate, in some sense, uh, uh, the Casimir perspective all the way to the ideal gas law. Of course, Casimir uh, considered this uh, and obtained this result by uh, thinking about quantization of the electromagnetic field uh, between the walls of the container and uh, uh, essentially saying that each one of these quantized modes corresponds to a harmonic oscillator, has a zero point energy, and if you were to change the separation of the two walls of the container, this zero point energy changes, and he got this uh, force formula. Uh, it's a force that is proportional to the area, so it is really like a pressure, and if you ask how strong it is, uh, you find that at a distance that is of the order of a fraction of a micron, something like tenth of a micron, or a few tenths of the micron, the pressure that you get is of the order of a fraction of an atmospheric pressure. So eventually, in order to see this uh, uh, very small force, uh, we had to wait 
until the devices that could measure force with sufficient precision at sufficiently short distances became available through atomic force microscopy in the 1990s. And since then, this uh, formula that Casimir had proposed uh, 60 years ago has been confronted with experiments with very high precision. So I started with pressure and ended up with the Casimir force that is really an interaction between the two surfaces that are bounding uh, the vacuum. And somehow this interaction is related to the fluctuations, in this case of the electromagnetic field, due to quantum effects that you cannot uh, remove at zero temperature. The electric and the magnetic field, you can't set both of them to zero. They will be fluctuating even at zero temperature, and this force arises. So you can ask, if fluctuations give rise to interactions, why not go back to our original thermal fluctuations? And this is the question that Fisher and Dejean posed and answered in the 1970s. And so imagine that we go back and fill the space between the two walls that were separated by distance d with lots of uh, particles, let's say liquid particles. They're vibrating, they have kT of energy, etc., and they are modified, these fluctuations, by the presence of the boundaries. Is there some kind of a fluctuation induced force between the two boundaries? The answer is yes, but typically we don't worry about it because the presence of a boundary, its influence only per, uh, penetrates the medium over a distance that is a correlation length. Correlation length typically in a liquid is of the order of few uh, atomic spacings, so walls that are very far apart from each other don't know anything about each other. What Fisher and Dejean said was, Oh, okay, but we can make this correlation length longer and longer by going to special points. At the critical point of the liquid gas coexistence, the correlation lengths diverge. If we have a mixture of oil and water at the demixing point, the size of the domains of oil and water are arbitrarily large. And so if you are at that special point where the correlation lengths can become arbitrarily large, you can, in principle, generate long-range forces. And uh, more importantly, that long-range force you can sort of get as a pressure just by dimensional arguments. It is due to thermal effects. And the only length scale that you have once the correlation length has gone to infinity is the separation d between the two plates. So you can essentially start with the ideal gas law, replace the density with 1 over d cubed, and except for just a numerical constant, which is a universal number that one can do some theory and calculate, you know everything about what this pressure is right at this critical point. And this was verified, in fact, in some experiments in 2008 by looking at interactions at this demixing point of oil and water and showing that this universal formula that was predicted by Fisher and Dejean is uh, satisfied. So uh, what is interesting is that as long as you have these long-range correlations, you can have long-range interactions between bodies, two surfaces or two objects that are in the fluid. And what is more interesting is that these forces, just like the ideal gas law, are universal. They don't have, they don't bear any signatures of the materials that are giving rise to these things. There is no material uh, parameter that appears in this or in the Casimir force. So that's the story of two quantities in equilibrium, the pressure and the force of interaction. Now let's ask about these quantities when we set up situations that are out of equilibrium. And I start by thinking about a particular form of non-equilibrium, which is now very popular in statistical physics literature. It is called active matter. So what is active matter? 
So one example of active matter are artificial particles, spheres that are coated differently on the two sides. So the coating is asymmetric, such that once you shine light, there will be interactions with the solvent on one side, but not the other side. And this leads to some kind of a propulsive force. So by shining light, you make these particles to move. You stop shining the light, and the particles will stop moving. Uh, well, a much more uh, primitive form of active matter is, of course, living systems, cells, and bacteria. And again, they are using the energy uh, that is uh, uh, through uh, the food that they eat and converting it to motion. Uh, there are other kinds of things that you can create, such as uh, putting a bunch of uh, grains on a, uh, on a table uh, uh, and then starting to vibrating this shaking grains. You look at all of these pictures, and they bear some resemblance to what I showed you at the beginning with the particles that were impacting the walls of a container, and they were exerting a pressure on the walls of the container. So you say, OK, these movies that you show me, at some level, they are, again, particles that are moving around. And if I were to put some boundaries, they will impact on it, and they should exert some kind of a force on it. So the question that we can ask is, is the pressure that these things exert on the boundaries of a container similar to the pressure that we are uh, familiar with in the case of the ideal gas? And one of the ways to test this is to write some kind of a computer code that mimics the motion of these particles and uh, look for the pressure that would emerge in this computer code. So let's see how we would do that. So basically, let's imagine that you have particles in two dimensions whose coordinates in two dimension r move uh, according to very damped equations of motion, such that if you have a force from a potential, uh, the velocity will be locally proportional to the uh, force. So essentially, the acceleration and mass are ignored. There is no inertia, which is very good uh, approximation for colloidal particles in solution. Uh, but of course, there is some kind of a noise. Uh, particles are moving around uh, because of the fluctuations. If I were to stop with these two terms that I've discussed, then I have nothing other than the standard Langevin equations of motion for colloidal particles introduced by uh, Einstein and others uh, a century or so ago. What the new feature of activity is, is this additional term, which says that the particles essentially tend to move in some particular direction with some velocity v. But they don't go straight all the time, because the direction in indicated through some angle theta itself changes as a function of time. You can either have angular diffusion, or you can have a process that is common for bacteria, which is you go straight for a while, which is called a run, and then you tumble and you go in a different direction. So you can simulate a whole bunch of these particles. How do you calculate the pressure that they exert on the wall of a container? Well, you introduce a potential of the wall that stops the particles from moving very far away. And uh, you calculate the forces that these particles are exerting on the walls of the container. Now, if you are doing a system that is in equilibrium, then the density of the particles at some location is really related to the uh, uh, potential that you have at that location through a Boltzmann weight. So uh, rho 0 e to the minus beta v would be the typical force that you would have, the density you would have at some point. And as you go further into the wall, the density would go down. Uh, so you can calculate the net force or pressure, if you like, by integrating the local density, how many particles you have at some point, times the gradient of the potential, which is the local force. So if you had the equilibrium formula, that integration you could do immediately. 
because you have the derivative of what is appearing over here. Uh, the integration is simple, and the result is essentially something that is completely independent of the properties of the wall and gives you back the ideal gas law. But in our case, we don't know what the density is when we are dealing with this system of active particles. There are ways of finding what that is uh, theoretically, which we explored. But one of the twists that we had to include was that uh, when a particle such as an ellipsoid approaches a wall, there is also a torque on it. So there is an additional term that we have to account for in the equation that describes the rotational motion, which is a change in direction arising from the torque on approaching the wall. And the form of the torque that we used was very simple. That is, the front of an uh, ellipsoid will experience more force than the back of the ellipsoid and will tend to rotate. Okay, with that, we could calculate what the pressure was. And we found that the pressure had two terms. Uh, one term really looks like an ideal gas behavior. All we need to do is to define an effective temperature, which is related to how fast these particles are moving around and tumbling. But there is another term that comes into play that explicitly depends on how we implement this reorientation and torque at the boundary. And so as a result, the pressure that we have is no longer simply a function of the density and temperature, effective temperature of the bulk. It depends on the walls of the container. And an illustration of this is over here, where we have essentially a situation of particles that were isotropic, just like the gas in this room. But we insert suddenly at t equals to 0 a partition where the wall on one side is harder than the other side. If I do that with the gas in this room, nothing happens because the pressure is independent of whether the wall is hard on one side or the other side, the pressure would be the same. But in this system, because it is inherently something that is out of equilibrium, you can uh, uh, convert the activity of these particles to a net force that moves the uh, partition in one direction. So this is an indication that when you go out of equilibrium, even for these active particles, which are simple, you get some interesting versions of the force. Uh, one of the other consequences of it is that uh, uh, if uh, you have a bunch of these bacteria that are moving in a two-dimensional surface, and you put a box on top of them where the box is not symmetric on the two sides, there would be a net force on the box and it would be moving in some particular direction because the forces are unbalanced. And this does not violate conservation of momentum because the particles are exchanging momentum with the substrate. Uh, it turns out that all of these effects, as I noted, are really a function of what we say the particles do due to this torque at the boundary. And if we were to simulate rather than ellipsoids where this tor uh, torque was effective, just the point particles or circles, this would be absent. And uh, one can immediately show that indeed in the absence of the torque, the only way that you can have a net force on a box is that there should be a current of particles. And of course, if you have a closed box, there can be no current of particles. But even for particles that don't experience the torque, some interesting things can occur, such as ratchet forces. So imagine that you have just point particles subject to this uh, active equations of motion that I have written, so that they are not uh, simple Langevin equations. And you put uh, them next to a uh, wall that is ratchet-like. Then you could, in principle, have a current of particles going in one direction and a force that is acting in the opposite direction, giving you all kinds of uh, ratchet-like phenomena that people certainly have seen in uh, uh, I'm not sure I wanted to do this, but let's see if I can go back. 
Unfortunately, some of my uh, thing is cut off. Can you uh, go one uh, page back? Just hit the back button. Okay, thank you. So I learned something that I should not go back. <laughs> okay, so the other interesting phenomena, rather in, in addition to ratchet-like behaviors that occurs, is even if you don't have an asymmetric boundary, but just a curved boundary, when we did our simulations, we found that the particles, the active particles, accumulated differently on the top of the hill and the bottom of a cavity. And this asymmetry leads to a different force that is acting on the top and the bottom of a cavity. And indeed, if you look at the variation of the force or pressure that you have on the top and on the bottom, uh, that variation in pressure is inversely related to the radius of curvature that you have, just like you would have had for the case of uh, Laplace's uh, contribution to pressure when you are dealing with a surface tension and a curved uh, boundary, such as a bubble, soap bubble. So what we find is that effectively these non-equilibrium particles are imparting some kind of a surface tension to the boundary uh, that uh, they are impacting on. And in particular, for the simulations that we performed, uh, this surface tension, or in two dimensions, the line tension was destabilizing. It had the wrong sign. So it tended to make the line, if it was flexible, to become longer and longer. So essentially, we did simulations where the boundary, rather than being rigid, was flexible. And we found that uh, this boundary would increase in length as much as possible. And this was actually tested experimentally in the following uh, system. So they had a chain that they put on uh, a plate with granular uh, grains. And you were shaking the grains. And you found that this uh, uh, chain that was uh, embedded in this uh, granular system uh, ex uh, essentially became unstable and became as long as it could possibly uh, be. Uh, there are a couple of interesting other effects that I wanted to show you. One of them is that uh, suppose you put a short worm in this solution of active particles, then what happens is that because of fluctuations, maybe the worm bends in one direction. The worm itself is not uh, uh, active. It's just a filament. Once this filament bends, the pressure on the inside is larger than the pressure on the outside, and it starts to move in one direction. So the analogy that I'd like to think about is that this is like a sail in which there was no wind. And the sail spontaneously bent, and it generated its own wind that it is propelling it along. And so this is, again, something that typically does happen in non-equilibrium systems and uh, is a consequence of uh, differences between equilibrium and non-equilibrium. If you have a much longer filament that is more flexible, then it does this strange dance, which it seems to want to first collapse on itself and fold on itself, and then it unfolds and it keeps going on and on. Uh, but uh, the story, or the lesson of this part, is that active particles at the boundary cause non-intuitive normal pressure, which could be wall potential dependent, and uh, tangential ratchet forces, and these kinds of uh, uh, line tension effects. So this sort of goes back to the first set of things that I told you about pressure of an IF equilibrium system. And this was pressure in some particular non-equilibrium system. Next thing 
that I mentioned was this Casimir fluctuation-induced interaction. So it's natural to ask whether if you have a solution of these active particles and you in put two boundaries in them, is there a force or interaction between the two boundaries? And several groups looked at this, and the answer is that no, there is no force, or actually I should be more precise, there is no long-range force that is universal. Essentially what happens is that these particles move for a certain distance and then bounce, and there is an effective correlation in which you make a disturbance in this active system. That disturbance is felt over some particular correlation length that is finite. It's not very big, and just like I was mentioning for the case of uh, uh, regular equilibrium particles, once you have a finite correlation length, you can only have finite range interactions, and they will be non-universal. They will be dependent on various properties of the system. So is, it, is the answer that there is no way in this non-equilibrium system to generate a long range and hopefully universal interactions? Well, the answer is that there is one degree of freedom that we have to think about, which is that uh, we can decide when to start shaking these particles and stop shaking them, or when we can start turning on the light so that these things move and turning it off. And uh, so we thought that maybe there is something interesting that can happen if you suddenly change activity and you look at what goes on transiently. Why did we think that something interesting could happen? The reason is that in all of these systems, of course, the number of particles, just like a regular gas, of course, is conserved. So that if you suddenly make a change, and you were to, for example, shake one wall, the influence of that has to go through the medium, through the process of diffusion. And the process of diffusion is something that generates long-range effects. In fact, that's why you are hearing me, although we are in an equilibrium, more or less equilibrium gas, is because uh, sound waves take advantage of conservations of uh, density, momentum, etc., to travel over long distances. So we were wondering in this system where there is, let's say, only one conserved quantity, which is density, whether some interesting long-range forces could be generated. And so what we did was the following. We asked the question, suppose you have this fluctuating density, and at time zero, suddenly you change the level of activity. You can either agitate the particles more, maybe you can start with the situation where they're kind of at rest, and then you start shaking them. What happens to the force between two walls that are inserted in this medium that you start shaking? Initially, there is no force, because essentially particles are not moving. If you wait very, very long times, Again, the force goes to zero because essentially the system readjusts itself, more or less becoming something that looks like equilibrium in the sense that the correlations are short-ranged. And so one wall does not know about the other wall anymore at very long times. But in between, something interesting happens in that you have to create some kind of a diffusive front that takes the information about one plate all the way to the other plate. And that takes uh, a time that is the diffusion time from one system to the uh, one plate to the other plate. So if I take the time axis and I rescale it by the diffusion time between the two of them, I can also calculate an interaction force between the two walls. And what we find is that that interaction force has essentially this universal character that we had seen for the case of uh, this fischer degen force of fluctuations between two, uh, two systems at a critical point where the correlation length was infinite. Except that uh, once I rescale the force by what would have been 
the result of Fisher and Dejean, I get a universal curve that as a function of this rescale time starts from zero, goes to a maximum value and then decays slowly to zero. And this curve is again, the full curve is universal. There is no material dependent quantities that appear in this curve. So in some sense, it generalizes the equilibrium result that was just at a particular point you were getting the pressure to having a full universal function, a curve that is a function of time. And uh, uh, essentially, uh, ter transiently arises and then goes away. And we tested this in simulations and uh, Indeed, that is the case. So I will skip the simulations in order to tell you about some other uh, rather interesting uh, non-equilibrium force of fluctuations. So I sort of set up the previous case as taking advantage of this conservation law giving you fronts that go over long distances. I created uh, a situation in which there were transient fluctuations that had to go from one side to the other side. But I could also set up a system that is in non-equilibrium and in steady state. How can I do that? It's very easy. I essentially have two reservoirs at two densities and particles that simply diffuse from one side that is at density N1 to the other side that it is density N2. And you would say this is a very trivial system. The average density simply linearly interpolates between what you have at the two limits. Now I insert a plate and ask whether the plate experiences a force. You say, well, these fluctuating particles as they are moving around, uh, locally at each point there is an average density and if I know what the equation of state is, there will be a pressure as a function of density and so there will be a pressure locally uh, on the walls that I can calculate in principle. But then you say the pressure is going to be the same above and below uh, the wall, so there is no reason why there should be a force on a wall, that's certainly correct. But if I have two walls, you would say, again, the pressure is going to be the same on the two sides. There is no reason why there should be a net force between these two walls. But then I say, okay, what you have neglected is the role of non-equilibrium fluctuations. And the non-equilibrium fluctuations that you have between the walls, inside the walls and outside the walls, are really different. Because if you think about uh, modes, just like Casimir's calculation, the allowed modes here between the two walls is different from the allowed modes that you have outside. So we did this calculation. We calculated what the fluctuations in density were at each point because you were inside between the two walls and outside, and we predicted that there should be a force due to the fluctuations of the current that is moving between the two of them. And uh, we did the simulations, and it agrees again with the calculations of the theory. Uh, it's uh, another one of these long range forces in that we find that the effective force is really due to thermal fluctuations. You have KT, but it falls off inversely with the separation of the two plates. So it is something that is really long range. It is due to non-equilibrium phenomena. So if the density difference between the two sides goes to zero, this force also goes to zero. So uh, it turns out that this force can be both uh, attractive and repulsive and depends on various material properties. So unfortunately, unlike the original Casimir force, it is not something that is universal and you can neglect everything about it. But the lesson that I would like you to get from this uh, part is that 
In equilibrium, there are many circumstances where you have short range correlations, fluctuations don't really go very far, and then if you modify those fluctuations by putting plates or some other inclusions, the interactions between those inclusions will be short ranged. But the same system, if you then generate some kind of a non-equilibrium current, the fluctuations out of equilibrium, as long as you have a conserved quantity, will be long-ranged and will give you long-range fluctuation-induced forces. OK, so let's see if we can proceed to the next one. Uh, Um, huh. Okay. Now, going back to the uh, quantum electrodynamics, uh, we talked about the pressure, radiation pressure, and you would say, well, there is a very simple example of a non-equilibrium radiation pressure. We teach that uh, all the time, which is that if you have uh, two plates that are at different temperatures, uh, then there is a current of heat that goes from one to the other that is proportional to the difference of the fourth powers of temperatures. That those are the same fourth powers that I introduced at the beginning due to the Stefan Boltzmann law. Okay, so that there is here, the difference in temperature sets up a non-equilibrium current of heat and we seem to know everything about it. Well, a few years ago, a colleague of mine at MIT uh, attempted to uh, look at this cl uh, classical law at short distances. So what they did was they used the same atomic force microscopy apparatus that was important to measuring Casimir forces uh, to heat a sphere and bring it close to uh, another plate at a different temperature and measure the amount of heat that was transferred from one to the other. And that is what's plotted in this curve as a function of the distance between the sphere and the plate. And what you see at large distances, it's actually scaled so that the large distance value goes not to zero, but to one, where one is the prediction of this Stefan Boltzmann law. So at far distances larger than one micron, the Stefan Boltzmann law for heat transfer works perfectly. But it seems that when you come to fractions of a micron, suddenly the amount of heat that is transferred between the two plates goes up by three, four orders of magnitude. So what, what is happening? Why is the standard formula that we teach uh, not valid in this case? And the reason is that the standard formula is based on propagating waves. And what happens at very short distances is that most of the energy is transferred by evanescent waves that essentially exponentially decay away from one substrate. So if you like, the heat in this case is carried through tunneling from one side to the other side and can go much larger in magnitude. So before proceeding further, we need some kind of a methodology in order to be able to account for this and calculate these kinds of forces. And uh, the way to do so was uh, proposed many years ago, 1959, by Ritov in a formalism that he called fluctuational quantum electrodynamics. It's actually a very simple idea. The idea is that if you have a bunch of objects each one of them is at a different temperature. Well, the effect of temperature is to cause fluctuations within each one of the materials. Associated with these fluctuations are, of course, fluctuations of currents. There are currents that are fluctuating in a material that is uh, held at some temperature T. And even if you go to zero temperature, those current fluctuations don't go to zero because you will, even at zero temperature, have uh, quantum fluctuations. Uh, so 
the mean current is zero, the variance of the current is given according to some formula that through standard results relates fluctuations to dissipation. So the imaginary part of the directly constant of the material comes into play. But then if you instantaneously have a bunch of systems with fluctuating currents, at that instant there's also a fluctuating electromagnetic field that is sourced by these fluctuating currents. And since this is a Jackson award, we can go and look in Jackson's book that tells us how to relate the uh, electromagnetic field to the current through calculation of the Green's function. And uh, Again, the average fluctuating electromagnetic field is zero because the average current is zero, but the variance of the electromagnetic field, you can calculate and relate to the variance of the current through the calculation of the Green's functions. Once you have the variance of the electromagnetic field, again, you can go and look up in Jackson what the pointing vector is that takes the current uh, of energy from one side to the other side, and you can calculate what the stress tensor is and what the forces on the object are. And so everything then follows from this formalism. And we can, using this formalism, obtain this uh, theoretical curve that is shown here that matches with the experiment for the heat transfer going many orders of magnitude higher. And we can also look at uh, forces such as uh, essentially having a hotter object that is bouncing up and down because of the effect of uh, uh, radiation pressure. So the story is here at this part, nothing that is qualitatively different, but that quantitatively uh, we can um, uh, see effects due to uh, uh, radiation pressure being modified due to what are known as uh, 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 near field effects. Uh, but I wanted to briefly show, uh, share with you some qualitative differences. Um, another version of non-equilibrium in electromagnetism, rather than having two objects that are at different temperatures, is to have an object that is in motion. And this takes you from what is known as static Casimir phenomena to dynamic Casimir phenomena, which describe force and radiation when you have objects that are in motion or uh, uh, essentially uh, oscillation. As a very simple example of such, what I have over here is an example of an object, metallic object, that is rotating in vacuum, okay? So what is interesting is that for this metallic object that is rotating by itself in vacuum, at zero temperature, we have to modify slightly our idea that angular momentum is conserved and this object will be rotating forever. And the reason for that is that, again, this object has all kinds of zero-point quantum fluctuations that are interacting with the zero-point quantum fluctuations of the vacuum. What is interesting is that the underlying description of this was predicted by Zeldovich a while ago uh, related to an interesting phenomena of super radi uh, radiance. What is that? Since we are looking at an object that has spherical symmetry, it makes sense to think about modes of electromagnetic field that have appropriate angular symmetry. And so they're described by some angular momentum, m if you like, e to the i m phi, and oscillating with some frequency small omega. So if I have a mode of electromagnetic field with these properties outside the sphere, from the perspective of an observer on the sphere, there is an uh, stroboscopic effect in which the effective frequency that the observer on the sphere sees is modified from the one that is in the lab frame uh, by the angular rotation omega of the sphere through this formula. 
What Zeldovich noted was that it is possible sometimes that omega is positive and omega prime is negative. And then if that condition is satisfied, then a mode of radiation that comes with some particular amplitude will be scattered with an amplitude that is larger, effectively getting some kinetic energy out of the sphere. So this super radiance was predicted by Zeldovich, and it has occurred in other contexts, such as black holes, etc. Uh, what we showed was that this rotating sphere by itself will spontaneously radiate in the band of uh, frequencies that satisfy this super radiance criterion. So the sphere that is rotating by itself gradually emits radiation in this band of frequencies and will slow down because of uh, this uh, angular momentum and energy that is carried off by these objects. Another interesting phenomenon that I wanted to conclude with is I started at the beginning reminding you of Langevin equation of a particle that is in a fluid and is moving around because of the thermal fluctuation. Now let's imagine that we take a small metallic object, nanoparticle, and put it in vacuum at zero temperature. Now, is there some corresponding Langevin equation for that? Because there are modes of the electromagnetic field that are also uh, acting on this object. So the net force will be zero, but there will be fluctuations in force. And those fluctuations in force will come around, uh, across because of the polarizability of the object. So they will be locally proportional to the gradient of this fluctuating potential squared. The Langevin equation that you write down will be different from the Langevin equation of the colloidal particle in two aspects. One is that the dissipative force cannot be proportional to velocity. It would violate special relativity. One can show that it is proportional to the third derivative of motion, so in frequency space omega cubed. That's one important difference. The other is that the uh, fluctuating force is not Gaussian distributed because it's proportional to the square of the electric field if the charge is zero. And it is the fluctuations of the electric field that are Gaussian distributed. The fluctuations of its square will be nonlinear. And as a consequence of that, one of the interesting things that happens is that the uh, probability distribution of this particle, rather than growing as a Gaussian packet, actually acquires these power law tails that are kind of reminiscent of uh, uh, Levy flights. So at the qualitative level, fluctuational quantum electrodynamics predicts unexpected phenomena when you are out of equilibrium. So let me summarize. So I started with the ideal gas law, which as I said is the bedrock of statistical physics. And uh, the, that corresponds to a pressure, but through a few steps we can relate that uh, to interactions that you would have between plates uh, that are uh, the standard Casimir type of geometry and the plates modifying the fluctuations. And as long as the correlation lengths are infinite, you will get these long range uh, forces that have the universal character in equilibrium. We asked what are the analogs of those things in non-equilibrium, starting with pressure. And the first statement was that uh, most of the time the pressure is very different from its equilibrium analog depending on the boundaries with which you are interacting, something that you don't have in equilibrium. And for example, that can provide an example of the type of ratchet phenomena that Feynman had been thinking about, as well as giving rise to these uh, uh, interesting phenomena due to curvature and the kind of uh, uh, line tension that can be induced by these particles. 
So that was the pressure analog out of equilibrium. The interaction analog out of equilibrium, we said that there was a knob that could turn short-range effects that you have in equilibrium short-range correlations to long-range correlation. And that knob is essentially taking advantage of conservation laws, that if you disturb something somewhere, that has to be transferred to long distances because of conservation through either diffusion or some other type of uh, wave-like phenomena. And it gives you the possibility of having long-range uh, interactions, and that these can be uh, seen in some interesting examples, such as just particles drifting from one side to the other, where just looking at classical equations, you would say there should be no, no force between the walls, but fluctuations do give rise to a force. Then we discuss the non-equilibrium analogs when we are, rather than particulate matter, with QED uh, 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 fields, and what we found was that essentially some of the results that we uh, rely on for uh, propagating waves, etc., when we have near field phenomena are very much modified. For example, the heat transfer can be orders of magnitude larger. So those were quantitative differences, but there were some interesting qualitative things to also consider. One of them was this uh, fluctuating Brownian particle, the analog of the Einstein equation, what happens for a particle in vacuum. And the other was this uh, uh, loss of uh, energy and angular momentum for a rotating metallic object because of uh, interactions with the fluctuations of the vacuum. Uh, this has been worked on with a number of uh, students, graduate students, postdocs, and some distinguished colleagues. Uh, I have throughout this talk that is uh, available online uh, references to various works. So you can just go uh, to my web page. This talk is there, and you can click, and you can see the various contributions. But I want to end with one thing, which is that I had also thought about, is there some kind of a useful thing that one can do from the knowledge that you have this rotating uh, uh, sphere in vacuum and it's gradually losing energy? Is there some useful uh, uh, thing that I, I can associate with that? And I was uh, uh, watching TV at some point, and I came across this example that seems to be relevant. Hey, working on thinking about how one could use the fact that a rapidly rotating mirror turns virtual photons into real ones as a method of observing dark energy. It's a pretty cool idea. Yeah, it's great you're here. I'd love to get an engineer's opinion. Sure. <laughs> this chair is squeaky. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think we can take time for um, one question, and in particular, if the folks involved with the meeting, the members want to come to work their way toward the front, if need be. Uh, do we have any questions? Yes. Consider, you, just, you consider the, the active particles on the level of the, of the uh, large rank equation. Yes. But this comes with two problems. The first one is you need a definition of temperature, but we know that uh, we know that you don't have a maximum velocity distribution. Absolutely. Yes. Deviates from this, which can express yes. by a, a, a expansion or a gear expansion, whatever you like. Yes. Uh, I mean, since you deal with small effects, how would the deviation from the maximum distribution affect uh, what you described? Okay. The second problem is uh, uh, you need um, you need a, probably an equation of state. Yes. Which also is not is questionable. Absolutely. Yes. I would like to ask you for. Okay. So indeed, you are putting your finger on exactly the right questions that is a uh, collection of particles that are active and are moving around, uh, 
people have attempted to describe with some effective temperature and effective equation of state. And all of those things are things that have to be questioned. So the Langevin equations that we wrote down are different from the Langevin equations that uh, through Fock-Planck are guaranteed to be described by a particular temperature. We just wrote down equations of motions that don't have the fluctuation dissipation relation that allows you to conclude that there is a Maxwell-Boltzmann uh, distribution. And we asked the question, what is the distribution that these collections of particles describe? So it turns out that in some cases, the equations are simple enough that you can describe them by uh, a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, but even then, the, that does not translate into the existence of equation of state, and the pressure that they exert on the wall is very different. And then there are other cases where even the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution will not arise. So uh, indeed, part of the things that I uh, want to say is that uh, uh, equilibrium statistical physics is a very small part of a much broader non-equilibrium fluctuation uh, space. And trying to force ideas like effective temperature, pressure, etc., on anything that looks fluctuating is potentially short-sighted. But wouldn't things become much uh, simpler, much clearer if you would go to a Boltzmann equation description? Uh, we do that too. So essentially, once you have some kind of a Langevin-like equation, then you can convert that into an equation uh, for, uh, for the probability distribution. And indeed, that's how we get our pressure formula, because uh, we convert our stochastic equation into an equation for the probability distribution and try to calculate what that is. All right, let's uh, thank and congratulate Dr. Kardar again. I'm going to call this award plenary session to a close, but I would encourage you to stick around for the meeting of the members, which is going to start immediately. And so I will pass this off to President George Ammon. Thank you, Janelle. Uh, I'd like to call to order the meeting of the members, and uh, I'd like to uh, have uh, Dr. Christian come up. Do you have a, a slide for the agenda? Yes. We do. There's the, it has links to it. OK, yet yeah, um, the, right, the website does have a link to the agenda that you can pick up. and. The first order of business uh, on a consent agenda is uh, we would like to have a motion to accept the meeting minutes from the 2017 meeting. So can I have a motion for that, please? We'll accept the minutes for the 2017 meeting. Thank you, Brian. And who else? Can I have a second for that? Yeah, we have a second. I can't see who did that. <laughs> but thank you. Uh, so all those in favor, please say aye. And any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. We'll take care of that. Uh, one moment, please. And secondly, I'd just like to have a motion to approve the agenda. Anybody, please? <laughs> thank, thank you, Dr. Okuma. Second by past President Bailey. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, at this point then, we're just going to have the secretary's report. Thank you, George. Okay, Richard, uh, Rachel, please first slide. Okay, next slide. All right, I'd first, uh, I'd like to officially announce the uh, results of the 2017 national elections. If you're here, please stand. Um, so you'll also see the pictures. So for vice president, we've elected Chandra Lekha Singh. Chandra Lekha? 
for director at large, we have our Lisa Richardson. Our Lisa, are you here? All right. And for treasurer, we elected uh, Stephen Turley. Steve, are you here? Now, as many of you know, uh, Steve, right after he was elected, has taken a job as rotator at the NSF. And since we have numerous NSF grants, uh, that would be a conflict of interest for Steve to be treasurer. And so the board of directors, next slide please, um, elected an interim, appointed an interim treasurer. Uh, Tom Okuma was appointed interim uh, treasurer to serve for one year until the next national election. Um, so Tom, are you here? So thank you for stepping into those shoes. Now, now those of you who think that it's probably unwise to have a Texan in charge of our money, um, the next slide shows that you can remedy this situation next fall uh, when we have the 2018 national election. The committee members are Sam Sampier, Sissy Lee, Steve Henning, Sarah Johnson, and Nathan Quardere. Um, if you would like to uh, or know someone who you think would make a good officer for the association, please see uh, See Sam. If you would like to be one yourself, buy Sam a beer. If you don't want to be one, buy Sam a beer too. So Sam's over here. Okay, next slide please. Um, this year we have completed two external reviews um, and I'd like to thank the committee members. We did, completed a review of the physics teacher. Uh, the committee chair was Tom Okuma, uh, Vincent uh, Talanquer, uh, Steve Kanan and Kelly O'Shea. So if you see those uh, AAPT members, um, please thank them for their, their service. And we completed a uh, external review of AAPT books. The committee chair was Steve Iona, Retta Lane, uh, Stephen Kennedy, and Beverly Taylor. So thank you for your, that work for the association. Next year, next, um, we are uh, planning to have a review of the electronic publications. Um, it's expected to be completed in 2018. The Publications Committee has voted to recommend to the Board of Directors that we commission this review, so it's not entirely official yet, but you can expect that Andy Gavron, Corinne uh, Montague, Sean Fox, and Ed Prather will be doing this review. So if you have uh, um, uh, ideas or strong feelings or uh, you know visions for what AAPT electronic publications should become, um, please uh, talk to Andy Gavron. And I know Andy is here somewhere. Right. So thank you, Andy, for taking that on. Next slide. Um, Mary Mogi has been charged, has been asked by our executive officer to, uh, to, uh, to reinvigorate the AAPT Speakers Bureau. Many of you may not know about the Speakers Bureau, but Mary is going around buttonholing people. Um, and so please see her if you would like to learn more about the Speakers Bureau. Or, you know, go to the Speakers Bureau, you'll see that you can edit your information. If your information is out of date, if you're no longer an expert on supersymmetric quantum field theory or something, uh, edit your profile and put in something, you know, put in what you are expert at. There are many uh, uh, AAPT members who would make excellent speakers, and uh, this would help people looking for speakers for section meetings and so on find you. <clears throat> Next slide. And I again want to remind you on behalf of the awards committee to nominate uh, deserving individuals uh, for the uh, summer meeting. Please nominate Millikan Medal, Klopstek Memorial Medal, Zitzwitz, Halliday and Resnick, and Distinguished Service and AAPT Fellows. Um, <clears throat> DSCs and fellows can come from area committees and also from sections, and we encourage that. For the winter meeting, we're looking for Orsted, Rick Meyer, Distinguished Service, Alpha Award, 
AAPT fellows, and occasionally we'll present the David Jackson Award, which we just heard a few minutes ago, and also the Phillips Medal. So um, that concludes the Secretary's report. Thank you.